This is an 11 by 14 uh, flat panel on a smooth surface. I like working on smooth surfaces because I can do the work very quickly. I'm not at all accustomed to a smaller size as the 11 by 14. Currently my favorite size is about 16 by 20. Here we are at the palette and I'm going to go over this very quickly with you. I'm beginning here in the upper left hand corner. You may or may not be able to see my pointer. It's a long handled brush. There we go. That's a little bit clearer. Uh, this is a burnt sienna. I use it as a warm neutral or a warm red. Then I have a violet. Then I have process magenta which I use as a cool red. Here I have a straightforward vermilion. And then here I have a cadmium red. Here I have a cadmium orange, I have a cadmium yellow deep, and a cadmium yellow medium. This is a lighter lemon yellow that I use. I can't remember exactly the title of it at this time, but it is a cooler, lighter yellow. Next to that I use a yellow ochre. I have a long history of enjoying that color. Here I have um, titanium white mixed with raw umber. It comes in uh, a manufactured form and it's called uh, like a linen white or uh, a titanium raw. This is titanium white in and of itself. Here I have um, light yellow phthalo green. Here I have a sap green. Here I have a straightforward uh, phthalo green. That's a very blue, blue green for me, and I'm trying to get a full range here from the brilliant, uh, paler, warmer green to something that's neutral in the middle to a very cool green here. Similarly, with the blues, I have a cerulean blue, which is a very uh, aqua type of blue. I have a cobalt, which is often referred to as a royal blue. It's a, a vibrant blue, and then I use the ultramarine blue, which has a tremendous amount of iron oxide in it, and it often goes uh, brown when it is mixed with red to make violet. So that's why I maintain violet on my palette when I use the expanded palette, palette as I'm showing here. Then I have a Prussian blue, which I tend to overuse. Uh, it's the manganese blue, and I overuse it as a shade element or a value control on my palette. And then finally with some resistance, but I keep it at bay from time to time, I have a Payne's Gray, which I also use as a value control or a cool uh, dark element for my color palette. Here's the reference photos that I have for the piece that I'm working on and as you can see it is two kayaks sitting on a grassy area in a yard underneath uh, a tree. So it's half in the shade here and then half in the light. The grasses move about as if they are water even though the kayaks are at rest and they're covered for storage. I kind of liked this uh, image when I saw it, so I took a quick snap and brought it into the studio and did some composition um, breakdown on it. I'm using the Baroque star pattern here in the white lines, and if you can see them in the red lines, I'm using the rule of thirds. So in the rule of thirds, we have a point here which corresponds with the Baroque star and a point here as well. Most of the subject matter is above the center line, however, given the nature of the grasses emulating the flow of water and the kayaks being at rest, I thought it was an interesting narrative. And the foreground grasses really do have a major role in the overall composition.
what I want to do today is pull back the shadow here, bring up the highlights here, simplify the grasses some, and bring the value up in that area. So I'm going to work uh, with a lot of uh, broader brush strokes at this time because I think the brush strokes are getting way too busy. It's a short brush and I'm going to begin by just setting up a type of uh, large wash area here to bring that light and lightness up. There we are. Now I have an atomizer that I can use and I'm going to just use my fingers a little bit. That's a no-no. Acrylics are toxic. And that just brings the value up in that area quite a bit and tamps down some of the shade. Here we go. Brought that up. Likewise up here, I'm going to take a little bit of this green. I've got principally here the thalo yellow green, thalo green light in play. That's a bit too thick. Uh, so I'm going to lift it out with the acrylic brush. All of my brushes are Taclon. At this time I used to work with a lot of natural hairs. Uh, the acrylic paint just eats it up. Turn this back a little bit. I'm viewing this underneath a tricolor indoor light that gives me a white light, a yellow light, and a blue light. And right now it's in the yellow setting because that is the closest to the outdoor color and palette that I was working with. It's truest uh, to the overall color palette of the painting at this time. Okay, so that brought those value areas up tremendously. Now, for the back area, I'm going to use some um, cooler, I mean warmer violet. Looks like it's close to the process magenta, but it is just a standard violet. And I'm going to just go right over all of that material there. So basically what I'm doing here is a stain. If I was mixing it with a media, it would be a glaze. And because it's not dry and it's wet, it's a stain and it's not scumbling. Scumbling is a type of dry brush. taking some more of that wash. I felt that the violet would complement the orange and the red orange more. Getting a little bit of uh, water there on that area. A little bit of the paint. There we go. Might be a bit much. I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. I really wanted a sense of contrast and mystery. The painting just seemed a bit too boring and obvious. I wanted to pull the viewers into the image to have mystery. Particularly since the subject matter is fairly simple. The kayaks are um, vintage uh, featherlight kayaks. Alrighty, there, we have that bit of richness there. Now I'm going to come in with a smaller brush. I'm going to try to match that value and just be off one or two uh, levels on a standardized value scale. And put a little bit more texture into the background there.
just so that it looks a little bit more earthy than not. And you'll note I'm using horizontal marks at this time instead of vertical to help that earth lay down and rest. Okay. To keep the brightness in the image, I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of uh, orange right there where the kayaks come out of the shadow. working for is supposed to have a soft brush, a soft look to it. It's not supposed to be defined. So I want to bring all of this down and break that form down. So I'm just going to go in and boom, like that, break that form down. It's just too obvious, it's too much of a in-your-face story, not leaving enough mystery for the viewer or the viewers and I'll bring that in a little bit too and here I'm using horizontal and vertical marks to show the grass is coming out of the shadow and into the light. Similarly over here take a little bit of the phthalo uh, green light and a little bit of the yellow ochre. Just put a few points of light right there. Okay. A few points of light here to match. And a few points of light here. Okay. Keep that flowing grass feeling alive. Okay. Now I want to bring this up forward and make that brighter. So again I'm going to return to the phthalo. I'm going into a mix of all of my greens and I'm going to grab a little bit of the process magenta to bring that down and gray it. The secret to green is reds and using 10,000 greens. So one of the things I like to avoid is using a whole lot of uh, the same color of green and using the same shapes. You have to have a variety of shapes going on. Some generalization going on here. I'm going to break that down a little bit. don't want it to look like I just put a bunch of dots in through that area. Okay. Go ahead and put a spot of interest there and there for the eye. One of the most powerful things you can do for trees is create the spaces between the leaves. So if you're feeling that your trees and your leaves are one big statement, break them up a little bit. Put some contour around the edges and fill in some dark areas in between the leaves. Now I'm going to punch up these leaves here just a very little bit. I'm going to really uh, pull in some white white, some of the raw titanium white which has just a 
tad bit of uh, raw umber in it. And put a few leaf, leaf notations there. On the other side I'm going to do likewise. But I want it to be a different green and I want it to be a different value. I'm going to blue it a little bit because they're farther away. And I'm going to go ahead and put a little more white in. Because when I blued it down with the phthalo green, it went very dark. I don't enjoy the Thalo products. They're way too strong for me. They are dye-based pigment, a synthetic, a strong synthetic. Uh, they tend to have very little opacity to them. They're translucent. And a little bit goes so far that I feel very overwhelmed by them most of the time. Now I want to bring this up a little bit lighter to give a sense that the shadow is falling right across there. And to do that, I'm going to mix a type of gray. I've pulled in some Payne's gray here into my mishmash of greens. Here we are. We have a little bit of gray. I'm going to hold it up now and see how it looks. That is going to work just fine for starters. Bring it down. I can always bring it up lighter later. So I'm just starting. There we go. There we are. A little bit more. Likewise, I'm going to put a little bit there, I believe, and that's a blue, so I'm going to bring that blue up a little bit more, and first I think I want to sink these two color areas and cause them to be similar. I'm going to go ahead and put that on there, there, calm that green down a little bit. Good. Put a bit of a point, focal point right there. There we are. That's good. Okay. Good. I'm going to bring these back as well. Right now I want to tackle that blue. Put a little bit of blue there. A little bit of white. I'm going into that same mix of color. Just a touch of blue there. I hope that that's light enough. Yeah, that'll do it. Okay, a little bit of blue there. Okay. Put a touch. shadow sensation across. And set that back. Set that back some. And that as well. And that. Bring that back. Bring all of that back. A little bit more. And there's some definition in here that I'm missing that I wanted to pick up. And it's in the Elysium. There's some Elysium flowers that run through there. So to help bring up that color value, and in paintings, color gets all the credit, but value does all the work. 
I'll just do some dotted lights. There's a lot of little little lights going on here too. Bursting out at the end. Probably not the best brush for these little marks. Um, but you'll notice I'm holding the brush down here instead of here or up here, which gives me the option to keep the brushwork very free and flowing for a little bit over here too. So I'm less precise as I use the end of the, the brush. I think Mark's bigger down here. Much bigger. Now the white is mixed with uh, some of the titanium and some of the phthalo green and a little bit of um, Payne's gray. There's a bit of a heavy splotch through here. So similarly with the greens, you want to have many whites uh, to get the layering effect and uh, a more realistic look. It's my understanding that representational realism painting, which this is an example of, is really a series of um, abstracts stitched together. I'm going to a rigger brush now. It's very fine. Um, I can't tell quite what it is, but there it is. You can see it's very small. There, you can see the point perhaps right there. And I wanted to do a couple of squishes here and there. In the foreground, you're going to have uh, more contrast and detail. And in the background, you are going to have uh, less detail and more blue base or cool base, and then in the foreground. So here I'm just putting in some Prussian blue and a mix of greens to create a little bit of movement and activity and uh, contrast. I'm also going to grab some burnt sienna and put some, some warmer tone here in the front to help the image come forward. Looks like it's resisting. Didn't get quite enough of it on there, or I atomized the tray too much, and it's full of water. So acrylic paints set up really fast, and they can be fussy and demanding, um, and they may need a lot more water, and then you have to balance that process with your palette drying out. There. Make it a little bit more opaqueness. And I have a bunch of, here we are, yellow dry grass there. This was taken late in the summer, so the grass started drying out on me. through the seasons, beginning around March, ending in September. I often press that into October and I'm usually pulling the kit out in February. And what I enjoy most is how the colors will dramatically change throughout the seasons. 
from day to day sometimes, depending on where you're at. In the early part of the year, there's an abundance of uh, spring green and bright green. In the middle of the year, it quite literally goes to a nice, firm uh, middle green. And towards the end of the year, a great amount of uh, violets, deep reds, maroons that come into play uh, in the color palette of nature itself. Put some very nice bright green right here. Keeping in mind that this, these grasses are flowing like water around the boats. It's a bit of an abstract in the realism. And there's some drama in the shadow. A lot of the paintings I've noticed right now that are popular in making all the magazine covers are a lot of backlit paintings where you have a central uh, image or subject matter that is very much obscured and in shadow and because it's backlit it has a halo of color around it and everything looks like it's got icicles around it. So I'm calling them icicle paintings. That's not quite dark enough. Get something dark here. I'm going to put some real dark, dark background in there. Color and light is relative, so if I pull this in really dark, then the leaves here are going to lighten up. There's a fence back here. You can see some of the slatting here from before, right through here where I'm brushing right now. Okay. And I'm going to bring that down just a little bit. It's just a bit too bright right there. And darken the corner here a bit, as creatively as I can. I'm going to put a little bit more color here. One of the things that I like to teach my students when I'm teaching is, is that at the very end of the painting, when you're toward the end or you're nearing the end, or if you feel stuck and you've worked with a lot of uh, shadows and values and you were working to get everything laid in, to go ahead and look at where your shadows are and then decide to infuse them with color. So instead of just having a bunch of darks there, go ahead and fill your darks with brilliant color. This is where we remember that value uh, does all the work and color gets the credit. It's when you come in and you give color its chance to take its credits. Putting a little bit of that in there. So I just laid in some blue and now I'm bringing in a little bit of white to bring it I like to mix on the surface, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I was just mixing the color on the surface. This is too violet right here. So I'm going to go ahead and see what I can do to bring that to be a little bit more blue. This uh, safety piece isn't red enough, so I'm going to go ahead and mix it special with a little bit of white. I believe it's a pump or a flare device. So 
so you can be safe when you kayak. It's there. And device like that. Okay. Very good. I'm gonna put a bit of an accent on that blue on the blue kayak. Going to reduce some of the equipment on the back of this kayak. Just tighten up the brush strokes a little bit. I'm not going to forget it, and I'm going to put my little bit of hidden highlights back in there. So there's a couple of hidden highlights. Don't want to forget those. There we are. Okay. Before I started putting in some yellow equipment. Now that I have this beautiful cadmium orange on my brush, I'll go ahead and put it in here. This one, just take that dark down a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. Get that shadow to glow. I like glowing shadows, I do. Alright, I'm going to get a touch of the grasses going here that I lost when I put the shade in. in. Get that sense of kayak swishing through the imaginary water of the grasses. I haven't forgotten the light coming through the fence slats back here. I'm going to keep that really soft. I'm going to work it throughout. And even remember to put it in over here. Keep that visual interest in movement there for the viewers. very busy painting. So what I'd like to do right now is just block in some big splotches of color to kind of simplify it down a little bit. down just a tad.
it a nice strong medium green now. And I'm just going to take some of these brighter points out. And down here similarly, just really big beautiful brush strokes. Making a warm dark. deconstruct this a little bit. And I think the same thing here. Let's do a little bit of deconstruction. This is still too yellow for me. It's dry enough now, so what I'm going to do is put a very thin um, mix of blue over it. Very thin mix of blue. Yeah, it's just way too yellowy. Very thin blue. And to keep the other side matching, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give it a thin, thin coat of blue as well, particularly on this side here. And now that I've done that, the underside isn't dark enough, so I'm going to go ahead and take my other brush. And create the darkest mixture I can, which usually means uh, alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue with just a tad of yellow. And I'm just going to go ahead and push that up into there. switch to the foreground here very quickly with that. If there's a color palette I love, it is violet and orange. And to reconstruct this here, I'm going to go ahead and put some medium green in there. Reinstate my grasses. Make sure there's a little bit of that color everywhere else. Okay. There. 
I wish I were a better painter. Here we go. Right there. And we have a twig of something here rising up and going that way. We have more than one of those. that one there and to stay in on the Fibonacci we'll put a third one there keep our ratios correct they're at the one third mark and they're kind of leafy we'll just put some leafy things there whatever those are I'm not sure a couple of leafy things same thing here. A couple leafy things. Put a little bit of uh, it's a touch of yellow on there. It's too much yellow, but leafy something's there in the plane. All right, I want to freshen it up just a little bit, not much. So I've got my rigger brush, and I'm just going to freshen. Okay, same thing over here. I'm going to just freshen. background area. Let's bring that in there. Take that warm out. Okay, so I think this is just about it for now. I'm not certain I can do much more with this. It feels to me that it is overworked, but I hoped it uh, helped you to understand a little bit more about plein air painting, finishing a uh, field painting in the studio, uh, working with the narrative of your subject matter, keeping a soft brush by using the end of your brush, using uh, 10,000 greens to avoid a bad experience with greens, um, working with your composition using the uh, Baroque uh, star dynamic uh, angle grid as well as the rule of thirds. If you struggle with composition I recommend that you look up Edgar Payne, P-A-Y-N-E, the American uh, painter, 
as he produced some incredible uh, composition simplifications to work with. And if you like this type of painting, you might want to look at uh, Anders Zorn, Z O R N, the Swedish uh, painter, or Joaquin Sorilla, the Spanish painter. S-O-R-I-L-L-A is the spelling of his last name. One of my favorites from this era of uh, painters, the American Gilded Age, which ran from the 1870s to the early 1900s, was Armin Hansen. He's an American painter who had some German expressionistic early training in Europe. Of course, there's John Singer Sargent, uh, the portraitist, but also uh, a phenomenal uh, painter who understood light and bounce light. Okay, so uh, I enjoyed doing this. I hope that uh, you enjoyed it as well. Thank you very much. My name is Vanessa Hannity, and this was made in Stockton, California.